Hello, everyone. Hello, how's it going? My headphones don't seem to be hooked up. Tell me if there's an echo and I'll mute myself. I don't know why Zoom isn't picking up my headphones. I could hear you okay for what it's worth. Hello. You can still hear me okay? Yeah. We can we can you. all hear you, yeah. Okay. I will Well, I think it, it, the um there's a risk of echo if my machine isn't doing good noise cancellation, but maybe the echo cancellation gods are with me. And um uh we everybody should uh Put, add yourself as an, in, in, in the attendance in the notes or shout out if you um, can't access a computer right now and would love to, I'm facilitating the meeting and would love, because I think I forgot to line up a facilitator for this week, um, uh, would love to have help with scribes if um, somebody could volunteer. And we'll just spend a few minutes for people to be and then also feel free to, this is a working session. So that means for if anybody's new, um, what we do is we'll add ourselves to the agenda in the meeting notes. And if you have something that might be of interest to the group, add a note and um, we, we do a sort of intros, up, updates, sort of stand up. And also if you are in a role in the group um, or leading a project, put that um, add that note so that new people or people who um, are new or to the group um, know who you are and we'll do just sort of quick intros of um, people with updates and people with roles. And then um, for we have a, somebody, some folks from the Kubernetes working group security audit um, who uh, put something on the agenda. And so, um, and then um, I also have some KubeCon updates um, I have, we have, um, I'll give those when we have them about the session and, you know, also this is a good time to talk about stuff that we might want to do there um, that, you know, I, I heard a bunch of ideas last KubeCon, so I'd like to kind of chat about the things that I've heard and um, see what people, if people have enthusiasm to do various things. All right, so I'll start. My name is Sarah Allen. I'm one of the co-chairs of SIG Security and on deck for these couple months facilitating meetings. Um, and um, I will be facilitating today's meeting. Um, next, I'll call on Justin to just introduce yourself. I'm Justin Kapos. I am, I guess I'm being proposed for tech lead and I'm also the uh, like a security assessment facilitator. Next up, and then I'll put also the tech lead TOC update on the agenda too. Um, Craig, do you want to just introduce yourself so people know who you are and recognize your voice? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Craig Ingram and I'm part of the working group for the Kubernetes security audit. Great. And then Justin Cormack. Hi, I'm Justin Cormack. Um, I'm helping out on assessments and various other things. Robert. Hi, Robert Shkaya. I'm uh, also working on the policy work group and I'm uh, leading the Falco assessment process. Super. You need to PR yourself to the README. Oh, okay. That you're. Yeah. So we can add you officially. 
Um, and also I'm asking people to, I think we did an edit to governance a while back that if you accept a role that you are responsible for having reviewed the governance and the details and responsibilities of being a member and being the person in your role. So, um, so Robert, I'm going to just start with you and require you to have some assertion that you've read the stuff in the governance. Um, because of research. Lengthy, and I want to just, there's a lot of important detail in there and I just want to make sure folks have read it before we. And is that a, is that a commit I make or just a comment or? So when you do the PR that says you're um, the policy, you know, we have the leadership roles in the README. Um, oh, actually, um, I won't take the time to screen share, but in the README, I refactored it a couple weeks ago so that it has roles in a section. And so the, it, it, so we did this basically because we were trying to, when we were sorting out the priorities for the security assessments, because they're prioritized some, because the TOC can like, we're giving them the authority to intervene and reprioritize, even though that has, you know, that doesn't happen that, that often, we needed to specify the different roles. So basically for the working groups we have, or the different ongoing projects, we have a project lead or, you know, working group leads, and then we have a chair who's responsible. And so the chair acts as if the TOC is ever like, hey, we're, we want information or we're concerned about this particular subgroup or work stream, then there's a specific chair who's responsible for like knowing what's going on and being able to communicate and vice versa. If the group feels like they need something from the CNCF or the TOC, then the chair is the one who will follow up and file a ticket at the service desk or bring something up in a TOC meeting or, or with the TOC liaison. So we're just kind of divvying up the chair roles so that everybody, every subgroup has a point person to go to. And so all of that, all of the individual naming of people we've decided is in the root readme. So, so Robert, just like add yourself to the root readme and then assert that you've read the governance roles. And when you're reading it, if you're like, this isn't totally not clear what my responsibilities are as one of the leads of a project, then that's a good time. Dude, excellent. You Thank can you. open an issue. You don't have to actually resolve the problem before we, because you're already acting as lead. I mean, we, we're still a little bit in the bootstrapping process. So people, you know, the policy group has been going on for a really long time, but we're kind of formalizing it and writing up the, you know, like the governance of it after the fact. Um, so it can be a little light on the process. Great. Will do. Thanks. So, um, so I will just kick off our agenda with Craig um, talking about the Kubernetes working group for security audits. Yeah, sure. Thank you uh, for, the, for the time to do this. Um, yeah, so, so basically some, some history, the security audit working group was formed by the Kubernetes PSC sometime last year. Um, and we went through a, a round of audit. The SC. Uh, the Product Security Committee, Council Committee. Product it's been Security. both. It's the council now, I think. Okay, <laughs> thank you. The, so there's uh, a group inside Kubernetes, in the Kubernetes ecosystem that's focused on the security of Kubernetes? Exactly, yeah. yeah they handle triage of incoming like security vulnerability reports and, and things like that, and then release I don't, I, Joel from our group is, is a member of it and it sounds like maybe we have some other members on the team so they can probably explain it better. Um, but essentially, you know, managing and triaging vulnerabilities related to Kubernetes. Um, and so we went through the whole process of um, a request for proposals from vendors, uh, evaluating those, set, setting the criteria for what we wanted the audit to accomplish, uh, and then having this big audit and threat model done for Kubernetes as a product. Uh, that was released at the end of last year. Uh, we are ramping up to start another assessment. And after KubeCon and, and a lot of like press and articles about it, there's been more interest in our working group. Um, since then, SIG Security has formed. Um, you all have been doing a lot of great work with a lot of other security assessments. And we were kind of, as a working group, it was sort of like the four of us as leads doing our own thing, not really out in the open, 
not intentionally or not other than, you know, contracts and things like that with vendors, but with the additional interest in our working group and what we're doing, just looking for some guidance and advice on, on, you know, what you all have seen that works, how we can be more open about what we're working on. If anyone else is interested in, in helping out with this round of creating a new proposal, getting a new assessment going and things like that. Great. Basically, we've been so successful, we don't know what to do with all the people who want to help. And you seem to have a pretty rigorous governance system in place. And we'd love to learn from you. Great. Well, thank you. We've been working hard to make everybody be able to act autonomously and communicate. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So first, uh, one thing that I'm not sure um, that we that you've heard about, or maybe not even everybody in this group has heard about, but um, where we sort of switched up the process in the last. I don't know, since last KubeCon, um, where all, all of the projects that haven't yet, the, the CNCF projects that at a certain stage can ask for an audit, and that now anyone that hasn't, when they first ask for an audit, will make sure they do a security assessment first. And so we're envisioning our assessment process as we've actually designed it to be complementary to the audit, because why? be redundant there. And also that kind of works well for the kind of expertise we have, you know, like there are people who do security audits in their day job and they don't particularly need to be doing it as a volunteer in this group. Um, and the real value of having the diverse experts that we have in this group is being able to kind of have an outside look at the project and understanding like sort of what's it supposed to be doing anyhow, right? And what's you know, what is the threat model and how does that fit in with other projects and, you know, which, you know, kind of trying to tease out the ecosystem from a security perspective. And so we're envisioning this thing that, you know, like we, we're bootstrapping, so things have happened out of order in the past, but that um, as the, as we went through the audit process last, the, sorry, the assessment process last year, what we realized is that the majority of the documentation is like, or like half of it, I would say, is what is this thing anyhow? What's it supposed to be? And a lot of what we end up adding value in is helping a project see where its bounds are or communicate where its bounds are. Because what we find is that a project will be like, well, of course we're not doing that. But looking at it from the outside, that's not at all clear. And so, so anyhow, um, I just wanted to mention that and like, I think it would be exciting if you wanted to go through the assessment process because now that you've done a lot of the pre-work and so, and it would be the first part, like Kubernetes is a many part project and we may get be getting a little bit of that with Spiffy Spire because it's a spec and an implementation, right? That's sort of a mini project with different things in it. Um, and in Toto was kind of like that too, a mini project with different things in it because it's got, you know, different sub projects, but Kubernetes is a really big project with many things in it. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I'd be curious about that, but, um, but first I want to give, uh, Justin Kapos the floor to, you know, like chime in because Ju Justin Kapos facilitates our security assessments and actually was doing this before we were yeah, before we were and brought um, kind of his experience as a TOC contributor doing audits slash assessments to, you know, and that really is what informed our process and kind of kicked this thing off. So, Justin? Sure. Um, I'm not sure exactly where the best place to start is. I mean, I can talk about some of the history of that and some of the things we've done with like Spiffy Inspire assessments and the way that we, we set things up and these are different, but um, I'd also like to kind of hear from you about what you'd like us to discuss and, and talk in more detail about how can how can what the things that I say be most useful to you? Well, first off, Justin, I was wondering if you've thought at all about whether our like would our current format for security assessments like would it be like plug and play with a project like Kubernetes, or were, would you be thinking that might need yeah. some tweaking? I, I think mostly it will fit. Um, one thing that we haven't done that much in the assessments we've done so far that we did do in the Spiffy Spire assessment that you probably want to borrow is um, 
is uh, dealing with um, basically failures or attacks or things that that um, have multiple different components inside of them, and have an attacker that that can sort of move, um, you know, like move between components because they get access to one thing. So rather than than sort of thinking about um, you know, individual points in a system as being separately compromisable and separately vulnerable and providing separate security guarantees, thinking about what happens when somebody gets into place A and how they can use that to then move um, and, and compromise B, C, D, E. Uh, because obviously in, in any type of distributed system like that, like, you know, Kubernetes, it's much more of that type of thing than um, some of the things that we've been we've been doing assessments on to this point, um, it it becomes a, a much broader concern. Um, Actually, having a bit of a language barrier, can I ask a couple real quick questions? Um, and I'd also like that's to where I was going to go. Yeah, I call it that. We have Jay and Joel on the line. Also, uh, we just kind of brought everybody. Apologies, <laughs> so they can chime in if they have something to say. Um, what is in, in, in the vernacular of this group, what is the difference between an audit and an assessment? Because and a lot of times we use them interchangeably. Yeah, okay. So, so for, an audit is something that sorry, so it, an audit is something that's typically going to look at source code and look for very specific vulnerabilities um, in at, at, at like a quite a deep level. Um, an assessment is trying to understand sort of the the design of the system and the components and the way that they work together. And it looks more at a sort of modeling and understanding things at a higher level. So you often won't look directly at source code in, in an audit. An audit will catch something like, here's a buffer overflow. A, um, an assessment will do things like point out, hey, you know, if somebody breaks into thing X that you didn't think was important, there's a big problem. Or, did you realize that um, you know, you're going to be leaking all this sensitive information into logs that the typical way you set it up is you put these in some public forum. So this is, you know, there's a big privacy concern in the way you've done this in your system and, and so on. I see, I see that might, interesting. Okay, so I think maybe we might need to back up a few steps and explain what it is we've been doing, what we intend to be doing uh, and how we would what, how, what kind of help we think we might need. <laughs> uh, so the four of us who have joined you today uh, have backgrounds in Kubernetes and, and security, and we were asked to help facilitate getting a third party to come in and perform an audit. Uh, but but in, in our case, we actually asked them to perform an audit and an assessment in your vernacular because we thought both were really important to the, to the security of the project. And we did, we finished that, we finished that whole ordeal. So we ran a comprehensive assessment and a comprehensive, well, that's maybe the wrong word, uh, in-depth assessment, an in-depth uh, audit of Kubernetes, uh, and got the results back. And we would have to, those are publicly available, and uh, I think that they would be an enlightening read. We, we've, we've looked at them and actually had um, the folks who did this give a keynote at uh, one of our prior meetings, like an in-person meeting that we had. And, and oh, so we- Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. This so, is the file. Stefan and Bobby came, right? It doesn't matter. I'm bad with names, so I'll let someone else chime in. But yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's okay. So then yeah, we're and, really and looking at that we, <laughs> sorry. You go, sorry you go, you go. All right. Yeah, and looking at that, I mean I think they did a very nice job at both things. But I think also that um, there were some questions around the parts of it that would have been in an assessment. There are things that would have been caught there um, with an assessment, which is tends to be a little lighter weight. And there was a fair number of things where, and, and I'm just speaking from memory, I'd have to go back to pull up examples. So, um, but there were a fair number of things where they said, well, we're gonna consider these things important and these other things out of scope and you know, just kind of dive in and get this done. Yes. And, um, the assessment process would definitely spend more time thinking and reasoning about that and would be something that is more appropriate for, for you folks, um, like folks in your community, uh, to basically go and help to guide with because you may also understand things about um, how the, you know, like basically how the system is, 
you know, like how it's deployed and ways in which people are using it and stuff like that, that might be hard for, for them to, um, you know, like them to necessarily fully understand all the use cases and stuff like that. Um, and, and so that can help you to sort of figure out where you want people to dive really deep and look in and do more of a deep source code dive. Um, I will also say from my experience, um, although I, it doesn't, I'm not saying that's true of the situation you had, you seem to have a good uh, team go through and do like the assessment slash audit as I guess we would call it in our vernacular. But I have seen quite a few um, firms that are quite good at doing audits, but are not very good at doing assessments. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it, the skill sets are similar, but not the same. Um, you know, being able to find kind of like buffer overflows in code does not necessarily mean you've really taken the time to understand how the software gets used in practice and whether, you know, the people, there's some UI thing that's going to just confuse users and make them default into insecure configurations really, op really often or all the other weird stuff that just comes up. Yeah, philosophically, I think we're in agreement, uh, which is why we, we asked them to build a, a threat model. At least that was the, the, the motivations behind it. Uh, as well as the rapid risk assessments. So maybe, I don't think I understand fully what it looks like for a project like Kubernetes to go through, uh, to go through your assessment process. Like, what do we, I assume that we have to dedicate some, some energy into helping that happen, and then I assume there's value that occurs. I just don't really know what that is. Uh, you know, again, philosophically, we we knew that we had a pretty time boxed and admittedly financially boxed uh, effort. So we did have to scope it pretty tightly. Uh, and then we plan on coming back in subsequent years and expanding on the research that we started initially. Uh, given the fact that we do have more that we pull in. What? Oh, no, uh, go ahead. I was agreeing. I was saying oh, yes, yeah. right. <laughs> um, but given the fact that we have a lot more interest coming from the Kubernetes community now, it could be that we have helpers who could help facilitate us uh, going through your assessment process in addition to uh, hiring another outside firm to do to expand on the threat model and, and, and to, to perform a... Uh, I just wanted to say, I just uh, dropped a couple of things into the chat. Uh, yeah. There's our, our overview of our process um, is in slash assessments in the repo. And then there's an outline. The process includes doing a, the project doing a self-assessment where they write this um, outline. And one of the benefits of that, or we're hoping, expecting that to happen once we have a bunch of these, is that if somebody's like new to cloud native or thinking of, they'll be able to see all of the CNCF projects with the same format, right? And then they can say, does this project match my risk profile, right? And so it's an opportunity for sort of Kubernetes to like, you know, sort of match that format and be like part of our catalog. It would be kind of sucky not to have Kubernetes in that list once we have more than a few. Right. Um, and so, uh, so I think that that would be high value to have. Like that's a big, we're anticipating that's a key value that is sort of independent of the work that the security experts do in the community here, right? And then I think there's, um, and so like, that's like a, like, so then the other thing that I think you, we get out of SIG security that you would, the, a paid service is not in a position to do is that if there's things that, if we're, if we see gaps, right? A project may well say, wait, that's not outside of the scope of my project. Mm -hmm. But then we have a community who would say like, oh, well, I do this here, or I use this thing here, and it helps us build that muscle. And we might write, make a recommendation that, oh, why don't you create a page in your docs that says, here are things that you can use for this thing that we don't do. And out of that came, you know, when we did work with Intoto, and it, you know, um, Santiago was very clear that like this doesn't this doesn't mean there are no vulnerabilities in your su supply chain. If you use Intoto, there are there's a place that it begins and a place that it stops, and so that led to his contributing the catalog, the list of supply chain um, compromises that he had collected, 
Mm -hmm. And then we're, we have a little sub team working on categorizing that to help the community understand that, right? So in that case, it was like a piece of documentation that came out of it, right? That was bigger in scope than in Toto, right? And so similarly, there might be some edge of Kubernetes, right? Where everybody inside Kubernetes is like, well, of course we don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yet what I'm hearing in the community is people new to our community, our bigger our cloud, native bigger community, cloud native community, they hear a reasonable message. message. If you want to, if you want um, to um, do cloud native, do cloud native Kubernetes, Kubernetes, and they get, and they get, they get the impression get, that that will solve all their problems. And then they quickly learn that's not true, but then the documentation of what do you do in addition to Kubernetes is like, well, do whatever you want. And that's not, and that's not Right. And, and I think also some of the value that the project themselves get out of this, um, a good way to see this is you can look through the Spiffy Spire. Um, there's a couple things on Spiffy Spire. One is they've done some of the pre-assessments. They're actually going through our formal process now. But um, they, uh, I wrote a couple blog posts along with folks from the Spiffy Spire team talking about what we found and why this was valuable um, when we went through this, like, you know, wasn't really our assessment process process uh, before. And uh, fundamentally, it really helps you figure out that it helped them figure out that things that they didn't think were that uh, like important from a security standpoint were actually really important and needed a lot of focus. And some things they'd spent a lot of time on weren't actually going to contribute very much to their security posture. And it really helped them kind of redirect and look at things in a much, much better way. And also made it so that somebody coming into the project and trying to understand like, what does this do? What does this provide? What doesn't it provide? You know, what do I still need to be worried about? They get that information, um, as Sarah was saying, in a, in a format that's sort of easier for them to digest and, and look at and understand. I think I'm seeing the value of the, the self-assessment. Uh, and I, I'll definitely take the time to go dig through uh, your formal process that you've documented. Uh, it turns out, I just learned I actually, unfortunately, have a hard stop at 1030. Uh, my apologies. I didn't know that. Um, I, I would also like to hear a little bit about how you're managing a community as large as your community and how you, you've found ways to engage lots of people and, and help them contribute to a larger scope of, of projects that you have. Um, and I'd also like to get thoughts and insights from the other groups working to thoughts and insights from the other groups working to the Okay. Um, in well, terms of the well, wait, 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 wait. Aaron has a hard stop in two minutes. Do you want I to? I do, but I do, but they'll all stay and they'll tell me everything that happened. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I unfortunately. This um, is reported. Also. There's a lot going on at work. So yeah, yeah it's reported. Great. So Justin, I cut you off. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and by the way, I'm getting some leg with some of the discussion. So if I'm talking over people or things like that, let me know. It's probably like a network thing and I apologize. Um, so it, in general, what we tried to do is just try to encourage, there, there's a lot of people that I think want to be involved in security and want to help out, but maybe aren't that confident. Like they feel like they've done a little bit and so on. And then there's some people that have been doing this for a long period of time and feel very comfortable. So one thing we tried to do when we do these assessments is, um, first of all, we try to be welcoming and try to build a pretty big group, not only to get a lot of different perspectives, which is really important to do one of these types of things, but also to sort of train the next generation of people who are going to lead the next set of security audits. And I don't know the actual numbers, but there's something like four or five people per security assessment that, that we're doing tends to be quite typical, um, of which I'd say, you know, maybe uh, one, two of them are people that, you know, don't, didn't necessarily view themselves as comfortable going in and being an sort of equal member, um, but I think rapidly kind of get up to that level. Um, and we try to be supportive of encouraging and, and encouraging about things, um, working with uh, the has, has also been really key, um, trying to give them good feedback, trying to um, have the, 
the process they go through where they provide the self-assessment, we iterate back and forth with them quite a bit to make sure that this is as clear as possible. And one of the other things we were trying to do is because the documentation we want to provide is supposed to be useful to lots of people, really anybody who's contributing to security has a, a level of security background, they should be able to understand anything in the documents that are provided. And so there's sort of this opportunity to, um, you know, like, you know, so I'll, I'll just draw from my own experience because I'm a, I'm a professor at NYU. Um, when I have new students come in to a project and they're doing things like going through the documentation, I'm, I tell them very explicitly, what you're doing is really valuable right now. You have something that none of us has. You have an outsider perspective, right? So you can help to fix our documentation in a way that we can't. Because to us, we know what all these weird terms we invented mean and all this other stuff like that, right? But, but other people won't. And so getting that perspective in and getting the, you know, the, the documentation to be cleaner when everybody's talking about, oh, we have this agent and this and that. And it's like, well, what does your agent really mean? What does it really do? Is it, you know, like how does, you know, what, what does that mean to people that haven't been steeped in your knowledge? Um, yeah, and so that's a, that's a big part of it. And of course, um, maybe Sarah, others want to say more about, you know, she's been great and, and others in the community being great about bringing people in and making this a, a friendly place, so. I'm gonna drop, thank you guys so much. Um, I'll, I'll check in with the working group when, when we're done. Uh, I'll, we'll probably come back, and say hello again. Great, thanks Aaron. So yeah, I'll chime in a little bit on the, the process stuff. Um, Cause like, I think that like I've done a lot of open source and grassroots organizing and, you know, have done stuff in the private sector and the public sector and like from, and a lot of like remote async work. And basically the philosophy is anyone should be able to come to our repo and be helpful and get involved without talking to anyone. Not that we're not happy to talk to people, but that it's all transparent. And that takes an incredible amount of rigor, right? To, and it takes like, you know, we have an open issue with the conflict, of, you know, like I worked to write everything down. And then when we actually need to use that, we're like, wait, this doesn't make sense. This is ambiguous, right? You have to practice, you know, people using these guidelines, right? For it to actually work. But then that means that it's like people who are around or like there's always a smooth path for people to step up and do something, which then allows, and we kind of have, we have this philosophy that, you know, there's certain things that the TOC prioritizes, right? And those of us in sort of named roles, like the chairs, we're like, okay, if the TOC asks us to do something, we'll do it. They might have to prioritize things in a queue, but, you know, we serve at the pleasure of the TOC. Um, but everybody else in the group is here for their own reasons. You know, it's not, you know, like, and then, so if somebody feels that something is important and they have the time and we have the bandwidth to like coordinate it, then that gets prioritized, right? It's not that anything gets prioritized just because somebody wants to do it because we want to have peer review and a certain group bandwidth. And so I think that that like, the fact that people see things happening, that they raise their hand, they want to make something happen. And then, you know, after a while we queue it up and it happens, I think that helps. Like you want to have a feedback of lots of like people do things and they're actionable and they move on. Does that, does that all make sense? Does that help? Is that the kind of thing you were, you might've been looking to find out? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's super helpful for me um, to, to hear that experience. And I think, um, there's a lot in, in the repo that we can go and, and give another read and, and learn from as well. So thank you for sharing all that resources and information. So, um, so the other thing that, um, yes. bring, oh, sorry, did you want to? Sorry, I, I, I keep unmuting on the, on my phone, but not on the, but not on the screen. <laughs> so I'm just, I keep trying to talk and, and, but I'm, but my own muting, but my own muting is stopping me from saying anything. Um, yeah. So for me, uh, Joel and I are the other two working group leads on the, uh, on the Kubernetes secu uh, third party security audit group. And, um, I think the biggest takeaway for me, um, here is, wow, I've got a lot to read. <laughs> like, I can't wait to read. I can't wait to read you know, more, like I started to read uh, the, the Spiffy Spire self-assessment doc during this call, like 
as Sarah, it's just been really awesome for you to paste all these links in. And so, um, yeah, I, I just, I want to, I want to um, read and understand more about um, what the, what, uh, what the CNCF SIG security, you know, um, security assessment is, you know, kind of like, um, and understand the gaps. You're like, where are, where are places where our threat model did a little bit more than you'd do? Where, where, where are the many places potentially where our threat model did a lot less than what you do? And, and can we, um, you know, and, and that'll give us a, that'll give us a, part of the reason for that gap analysis is if we know the places where the threat model, you know, may have fallen short of the, of the assessment model you guys do, then we can take all the volunteers, you know, we can take all the sig, all the, all the, all the working group members we got out of KubeCon and, um, and ask them to help us fill in, you know, and ask us to fill in, you know, the last year's worth of effort to at least have it so that our first, you know, our first go round, we're doing this, you know, we're doing this cyclically um, is, you know, is more complete then. Um, Cause that sounds, that sounds great. And then, great. And, uh, yeah. And I, I just want to say one other thing. You will see a little more of this in the Spiffy Spire audit than is required in our format. But the Spiffy Spire audit, as I mentioned before, they they worry more about collusion sort of cases, which I think very appropriate for the project. And also as part of that assessment, we did um, a much broader examination of uh, trying to quantify the risk of different type compromises to um, prioritize where they would put efforts uh, to fix things. Whereas in the normal security assessments, that we do for other projects. Um, our goal is to really find out the current security posture, not as directly to go through and try to make detailed recommendations for their team to guide their development, which was more of um, like was a, a much stronger focus when we did this 50 Spire assessment. Um, so uh, I Would think there be a sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Would there be one that you guys think, like if we were to read Spiffy Spire, so it, like if, if we were to take like a kind of reading list, it seems like Spiffy Spire is on the list, the, you know, the, the overarching, you know, this is, this is what, you know, this is what we're doing, this is what, you know, this is what we call each of these things. But is there a, is there a, a second, um, is there a second assessment that you'd recommend um, that we also look at to kind of get those two, like you know, you're going kind to of describe what you did for Spiffy Spire and then what you did for others. And, and I'm game for reading too. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, so one thing you also might want to do is read just the post that talks about the work we did for the pre-assessment, because this is kind of the value that nice. people saw coming nice. out of it. Um, and it's a two part okay. blog post. There's one in part two is linked off of part one. Um, but it, in terms of another assessment, I think you could read really just about any of the other assessments, like the Intoto assessment, and get um, like a slight. It's it's a very you know going to be very similar, obviously, but it's not going to be uh, it, it's not going to be identical. Whereas the Spiffy Spire one was sort of they'd done some extra work in some areas, and maybe there were a few things that they didn't quite need to do for this, like um, only later did we add some of the discussion about um, how is your software actually built and who reviews things and stuff like that, where that wasn't part of the examination. You know, I didn't look at how they built the, the Spiffy Spire, like the, you know, the Spire support they were using as part of it, um, that initial pre, like uh, pre-assessment thing. Um, but, but that sort of got, um, the Spiffy Spire is, I think, the most exhaustive one that we've had due to the fact that they've had sort of both of these processes happen. Um, but something like Intoto, the Intoto assessment, um, which I can post a link in, in a minute, would be, I think, more representative. Okay, so Spiffy Spire, Intoto, two blog, the two blog posts, and then the standards that, and then the standards that Sarah's been pasting in. Sarah, you, you're muted. Oh, Sarah, you were you were talking about your oh, I think Hi. you. Yeah. So um, so I want to leave a little time to talk about KubeCon, um, and I just wanted to maybe we can have a point person who would be interested in following up. I think that um, there was a Kubernetes 
threat model that was pr presented last week from the financial user security group. And there's, we had sort of like, well, that's not really particular about finance. And we were thinking about, you know, like, should we move it? We, we should at least refer to it from our repo and may move it. And then like, if there is, if you have volunteers who are enthusiastic and either knowledgeable about Kubernetes or wanting to learn about it, there are some ideas about, you know, like presenting it in different ways, you know, maybe experimenting with different parts of the tree. So if you have um, interest, um, maybe I can follow up offline with one of you. Sure. I, I think, uh, I think uh, Joel and Craig and I will probably nominate Aaron uh, and under the, uh, Whoever leaves the whoever's out early uh, gets uh, gets things assigned to them um, to be first right. follow up. Um, I'll, I'll I'm sure one of us will help if he declines. But um, you said there's a there's another Kubernetes threat there's another Kubernetes threat model besides the one our that, that we did. There's a you said there's one out of the financial group. So they a, did a like a, a attack tree, and um, oh nice. It's very it's really nice and it's nicely presented and I think the format is cool from like a Bruce Schneier paper and we had some discussion nice. about like alternate ways to present you know in terms of you know what's a link and what's a node um, that Justin Capos brought up and I've been meaning to like write up an issue for like hey maybe somebody you know wants to do that and so if I wrote up an issue like you know like maybe one somebody from your group would be interested in helping with that and we could you know like collaborate on bringing that into more of a general forum, right? And then, you know, you could chime in and say, this is our threat model description and so forth. Is this, is it, was that, um, was their presentation something that was done in this where we could go and watch the Zoom recording? Yeah, so the last week's you, recording should be on YouTube by now. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll go watch uh, it today. Jonathan, who worked on that, uh, had, had reached out to us uh, while he was working on the process and while we were getting our reporting done and we weren't able to get too much collaboration, uh, but really love the results of all the work there. So it's great to see. Sweet. Let's start my lunch video now. All right. So, um, so now, uh, thank you very much for coming in and talking. And if anybody from the group has, um, I wanted to give time for other people to chime in, please mention things in chat and then we'll circle back um, async if needed and um, and you know we'll work together and you'll hear more about this. But um, I wanted to just for a few minutes chat about KubeCon. Um, with, uh, normally at KubeCon, the SIG has an intro and a deep dive session. The EU venue is um, more space constrained and KubeCon keeps growing. So <laughs> we will have one session, which I think is fine. Um, and because we, we are also having a cloud native security day on the day zero. And one of the things that I asked Amy is whether we could have a location. One of the things that happened at the last couple of cube comes is people were like, where do we meet? And we're like, we'll meet by the puppies. And it's like async via Slack, but not everybody's on Slack. So I was thinking of having like a, a figuring out, like I'm sure we can get some place with a sign that we know ahead of time that at least has like some places to sit down or and or a table so that we could, you know, at minimum have us chairs, you know, there, but like maybe we could like basically have like office hours for six security or a place just for us to meet each other. And I wanted to just see if people had thoughts, ideas, like this is the time that if you want something from SIG security at KubeCon, you, they were very influenceable. Um, and then the other thing about that I wrote up the description to be um, an introduction to cloud native security rather than an introduction to the SIG because that was like kind of based on a bunch of feedback. So I thought I would just try that this year and might ask various people here to um, like present parts of it or I, I you know, haven't quite figured out what it's going to be, but I think that would be a better intro. And then we can surface a bunch of the resources that we've provided and leave some time for people to meet people with the SIG. So thoughts from the group? Yeah, um, I'd like to uh, uh, to mention one thing. So um, the projects, like the maintainers of projects are offered to be able to uh, like have a booth or to have a certain booth and have sort of office hours during the event. Was that also offered to the SIG? Because this seems like an ideal way to do it. Yes, that was not. I have requested that. 
So okay. I'll chime in here. Um, I want to be able to give everybody everything that they want, but as we've noted, Europe is really, really space constrained. What I think we can probably do is definitely get like a meeting place sign set up. I am not sure if we've got the space to be able to have the SIGs also included in being able to have the, uh, in, in the project pavilion. Yeah, so it, I'm not saying that it has to be any space that isn't already planned. It's just that we pick one of the many meeting areas to put a sign, ideally that we would know ahead of time so that it can be, because not everybody is like on, it's hard sometimes to communicate to new people, you know? Um, so that's a, it's really just like picking a spot and sign and, and making a sign and having a sign, Amy. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. Right now, our events team has actually been pretty busy in getting the schedules out together. As we move forward from here, we'll be able to actually give more information about like how the project pavilion is getting set up, um, uh, you know, other pieces on site. So, yeah, but I mean, like last time we met with the puppies, right? Like it doesn't, <laughs> it's totally doesn't like have to, I mean, it might be nice to, wherever you think it would be good. I mean, and we could also potentially meet at one of the security projects for some time. You know, like, I think that the, the actual venue is flexible, but I, what I wanted to get feedback from the group, and thanks to Amy for chiming in, because I'd heard that, but I think everybody needs to hear um, where, you know, we are in the process of preparing for KubeCon, so appreciate that. Um, but wanted to hear from the group, like, you know, whether um, people would be interested in, like, participating in office hours, or you just think it's a good idea, wish it had been there when you were new, or you don't care, you know, like, if you don't care, you don't have to say anything. I, I would be interested in participating, and we actually didn't, uh, decided not to do a tough maintainer booth thing like that, um, in part because we think we get enough traffic during the talks and things like that, um, that we're able to, to really connect with most of the people that we need to. So um, I do wonder, I, it does seem like, you know, that maybe there's a way to do that, or maybe there's even, I, I'm gonna go off on a tangent here, that's probably a bad idea, but I'll, I just wanna throw it out there. So in some ways it would be nice also if we could select like X talks and say, this is like the security block um, so that we don't end up in situations like we have in the past where there's, talks on Tough and Intoto at the same time or talks on SIG security the same time as, uh, you know, Notary or OPA or something else that we all might want to go to. Um, and then that might also, if that were to be a thing, that might also give a way for, you know, as people stumble into that, you can kind of chat with people and learn about security and sort of like have the, have the crew around. But uh, yeah, once again, I, I apologize for the tangent. That's okay. That wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, uh, as I look at a uh, draft of the schedule, I will review to be able to see if there's like obvious conflicts like that. Great. Thanks, Amy. Other folks from the SIG who have thoughts? Yeah, I think as long, I mean, I think it's a good idea to have somewhere that we have an advantage. I mean, there's enough of there's enough people involved in SIG security. I think it's actually. I mean, again, like just now, we didn't ask for a, a booth or anything for notary just because there's not enough people to be able to you know have anyone there all the time. But for SIG security, I think we could have kind of office hours in a more kind of in a way that doesn't interfere with other people's ability to go to talks and things like that all the time. Great. So yeah, we'll see if we can set that up and um, we'll, uh, you know, loop you in as we figure stuff out. Um, I don't know if Dan's still here. I didn't introduce, I don't know. On mute. Um, so there was one more thing about KubeCon that I have now spaced. Um, so I think that, uh, oh, I was gonna mention the TOC. So those of you who don't know, the TOC is having elections right now. We have a, a um, board of folks 
um, who are being nominated for the um, open positions on the TOC. And, um, and the TOC is kind of paused in its voting while it's onboarding new members. Um, we have um, identified some folks um, who have agreed to be nominated as tech leads who have been um, very active in this group. Um, so we nominated um, Justin, Emily Fox, and Brandon Lum. And I have like little, I was getting a, yes, I agree to be nominated from each one of those before I communicated to the group. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we're sort of figuring out the process as we go. And I have some PRs out on the, um, the TOC repo to try to clarify this thing. So, um, so I just wanted to, um, to mention that that's, that's going on too. And, um, and then, so we're going to nominate them and then they'll be voted on by the new TOC when it's appointed. And that will probably all happen async. So, um, and then we're anticipating that that will be, that we'll, we'll over time have a larger group of tech leads, but we want to start with, you know, kind of a small group of people who've been playing leadership roles so that we can just kind of expand the leadership team capabilities. And those of you who are around at the very beginning of SIG security, which was like six, seven months ago, what we decided to do at that time is our current chairs, Dan, JJ, and I, are chairs who also act as tech leads because the TOC separated the chairs have a sort of more administrative facilitation role of the whole SIG and how it fits in with the rest of CNCF. And then the tech leads are expected to be deep subject matter experts who could do like a deep dive on a project and are like kind of um, you know, sort of deep in the, I mean, topic matter. I mean, of course, the chairs would be knowledgeable about it. Um, and so we wrote in our governance that as soon as we had two tech leads, then the chairs um, can, you know, sort of act as um, more like step back into that facilitation role. So I still have to like sort of, I, I caught some things where our governance isn't aligned, but now we are out of our bootstrapping mode, or we will be as soon as we actually appoint tech leads, and then we'll be sort of disambiguating the chair from the tech lead role. And in the future, you could have a chair that is a tech lead. Um, so that in June, Dan Shaw's term expires so that we can have staggered terms. And then we could have somebody who is, you know, like maybe more on like familiar with the security landscape from a business perspective, who isn't wouldn't be somebody who could also be a security reviewer or something like that, right? It just sort of expands the set of people that we could potentially have as a chair. Um, and it aligns with what the TOC decided to do with the SIG roles. So, so I kind of made it, wanted to make everybody aware that that's going on in slow motion um, and uh, open the floor if you have, I think Amy knows more about the TOC process if anybody has questions. All right, then. Thanks, everybody. We'll end a few minutes early. Chime in on Slack if, uh, if there's any follow-ups. And thank you, note takers. Uh, really appreciate um, catching up on notes. Bye. Thanks, everybody.